Excellent. So, good evening. Um, thank you very much for the, the introduction, Russell. Um, yeah, hardware's a nightmare, <laughs> let's be honest. It's, uh, you know, software's difficult, software's not easy, but hardware is, has its challenges, we'll say. Um, the mistakes are a bit more painful than it is with software. Um, but none of this is easy. You know, starting a business, running a business, doing a startup, it really doesn't matter what area you're in, it's, it's a challenge. Um, so what I'm going to do this evening is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've developed our product and um, how we've built a team. You know, teams are so, so critical to what you do in startups. You know, they're absolutely the, the foundations of everything you do. Um, you know, without a good team, you're never going to get to that end goal. Um, and I come, I come from a kind of strange background. I, um, I'm an electronics design engineer, so that helps with the hardware side of things. Um, but the amount I learned in a startup, you know, industrial design, product design, tooling for plastics and app development. You know, I'd never been involved in app development before. Man, you've got some massive challenges in apps that from a hardware guy, you know, you look at it and think that's pretty easy to do. Not the case, not, not at all. Um, so yeah, I come from this electronics design background. Um, crazy, mad sports guy, you know, absolute passion about sports. Um, and for seven years got very passionate about golf. And, and you know, you start to come up with these weird solutions for things, start to look around the market start to get interested in tracking your own stats and all of a sudden, bang, you've got an idea. Um, so just before I go into kind of the journey and the story, I always like to kind of understand a bit about the room. I was also a high school teacher for two years, um, so I'm always interested to know who's sitting in the room. So who have we got here? What, have we, uh, what about anyone that's involved with a startup at the moment, if you could raise your hand? Okay, pretty good actually, really good. Uh, anyone that is thinking about a startup um, or has an idea and is just Thinking about that next step. Okay, a few. That's good. Excellent. Um, okay, perfect. So we'll talk a wee bit about the journey. So um, the short scope journey really started in 2012 um, with an idea. Um, now I was collecting a lot of my stats, a lot of my analytics using pieces of paper, um, spreadsheets, real geeky, geeky stuff. You know, an electronics de design engineer, try to improve your game of golf through data. What a surprise, you know. Um, and the idea phase, you know, lasted about a year. You know, I had a lot of other ideas, but this was one of those ideas that was sitting there. And then the next phase, idea to concept, was a bit longer and a bit more challenging. Um, and the reason I've got this slide up there, and it's kind of out of proportion, is the amount of work that goes in to the second phase is unreal. You know, that um, we've got a good idea. Well, there's a lot of people have great ideas, you know. Um, I think the stats are there's 500,000 good ideas every year in the UK. 50,000 people actually do something with them. 5,000 people actually take them and try to build them out. And 500 people generate a company from them. But, you know, you're in the best environment in Edinburgh to be one of those 500. It really is. Scotland is a phenomenal place to start a, a tech business at the moment. Um, but certainly the vast majority of the work is on that taking it from an idea to a product, to a company, you know. That is a massive, massive step but very doable, especially here in Scotland. Um, I guess I better talk a wee bit about what we do before we get into you know, how to build a company and how to do things. Um, really simple, uh, golfers, they want to monitor their stats, they want to monitor their analytics, they want insights into their game. Golf actually lends itself to data. You know, there's a, a whole array of data you can collect about individual areas of your game that allow you to gain insights and allow you to understand your game in a much better way. Um, but the problem is for the vast majority of golfers to collect that data is extremely painful. You know, you'll see stats on the television, you'll see anal analytics on the television. Well, believe it or not, it's done on the PGA Tour through 14 electronic devices on every hole and 400 volunteers manually collecting that data. And that then all goes to a team of engineers that process that data. So, I mean, the average golfer just can't get access to that same type of data. And the idea was, how, do you get a how does that average golfer benefit from collecting data. Um, my own journey was I started playing golf, 16 handicap, within a year became an eight handicap. I was not hitting the ball any different. I was hitting it exactly the same, but I'd gathered all my stats, all my analytics. I was now understanding how to manage my game to a much higher level, and then managed to get my handicap down to five in about another two years, all just through managing my game. But it was all done very painfully. But same again, geeky engineer, you know, it's great. Um, and for the average amateur golfer, the only way they can do it is manually collect things using an app, using a phone, using a device, 
or even in the professional game, they've got a bigger issue. A lot of those devices aren't legal for use in competitions, so they use still, still use paper and pencil out with the PGA Tour. It's unreal. You know, where technology is absolutely key to everything we do, they're still using paper and pencil at a professional level. So I had an idea, but before I got into developing the technology, I thought it was really, really important to go out and understand the needs for the market. And that's something I would, I would, I would say to everybody, go out and talk to your market. It's so, so critical to what you do. You know, you don't want to go and build an app, you don't want to go and build a piece of hardware, get a year down the line, and you've built something that the market isn't interested in. And we've all got a fear here of, you know, giving away that million dollar idea or that billion dollar idea, I guess, for a lot of companies. Um, man, you need to get over that, right? Just go out and talk to the market. You know, is someone going to have the skills, the desire, the interest, the effort levels to go and put everything in place to do exactly what you're going to do? I very much doubt it. And, you know, if you are worried enough, don't go and talk to someone who's in that marketplace at the moment. Go and find this place over here that you can go and talk to that really, you know, the, the odds are you're not going to find somebody that's going to copy your idea. Um, so for me, it was 800 questionnaires into golf clubs. And there's nothing like talking to people. So I actually went and was at the golf clubs and got those 800 questionnaires answered myself. Now, it was to make sure I was doing the right thing regarding leaving a job to start a company. But the insights were amazing. You know, the insights told me that golfers who are 16 that are interested in this, golfers who are 90 that are interested in this. And that's a big part of the market that isn't being catered for. You know, the higher demographics in a sport like golf. Um, it also told you some interesting insights. You know, the higher demographics, a lot of them aren't comfortable with technology. Okay, so that, that tells you a lot. You know, a mobile phone, an app, it's going to be difficult. Um, any interaction during the game, going to be difficult. Um, even the setting up of technology, potentially be difficult. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to build a bit of tech that they can set up in five minutes. So that doesn't sound too challenging. Well, the reality of that is, you know, you've then got to go and build hardware, software, apps that they can understand and use really quickly, you know, instinctively. Um, Apple are the best. You know, your, your Apple devices, you know, um, my, my parents use Apple devices, my grandparents use Apple devices. It's probably the only device, the only product out in the market they could actually use comfortably without constantly coming back and asking for help. You know, it's just instinctive. And that's what you've got to do when you're going to build good products, good apps, good hardware, doesn't really matter. It has to be instinctive, especially if you're dealing with a higher demographic like we were dealing. Um, and of course, that comes with some competitive advantages, so it's well worth putting in the effort. So we had some key kind of design ethos around what we were building. Had to set it up in five minutes, um, had to be um, used without interruption, so you didn't have to interact with the product during play, and you, and you didn't have to carry a phone in your pocket. A lot of the market was quite adverse to carrying a phone in their pocket, and we do have competitors that you know, use the phone, um, but the golf market was quite adverse to it. Um, and then it has to be easy to get those insights out there. And unfortunately, there was absolutely nothing in the market we could just take off the shelf and use. So we had to build our own hardware, um, and actually we had to build our own IP end-to-end. -end. Now that comes with some interesting pitfalls and some advantages. Um, one key advantage is we have this very custom hardware that you will not get in any other wearable in the market. Um, we have these little tags, they go into the golf grip, and we have a wearable that's got similar things that you would see in other products, accelerometer or gyroscope, um, but it's got extremely accurate GPS, and it's also got RFID integrated in there, and it can transmit RFID at a very, um, a, 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 a significant distance to talk to these little passive tags. Um, and there's just nothing in the market that will do that. No Samsung product, no iWatch, nothing will do that. They're designed for a completely different purpose. So to come and answer the questions here, we knew very early on we were going to have to build custom hardware. And that was going to be an interesting process. Um, and we came up with ClubSense. So ClubSense is our patented technology. Other piece of advice, you know, um, ClubSense is extremely, extremely technical. And relies on electronics hardware, relies on embedded software, relies on cloud-based algorithms, and a big data set of 35,000 courses mapped yard by yard. The market does not want to hear that. The market wants to hear a brand name that they can say, that works, and I don't care. Nobody switches on their car in the morning and thinks about what's, what was happening, right? You just switch it on and you drive it. That's the best analogy. When you're building a product, 
instinctive. You know, they want to use it and just get the results from it. They don't, the, the market doesn't really care how it works for the vast majority of the market. So, I mean, it's great to stand and talk about your technology. And, you know, as I'm, I'm a techie, right? I'm an engineer. I would love to stand here and, and talk about how some of this works. But there ain't too many rooms I can go into and do that, you know? Um, the vast majority of rooms, they just want to know it works. Give me my results. Um, so our club sense technology, basically, these little tags go into the top of the grip, you wear the wristband, you go and play, and we can automatically identify the location of every single shot you hit. Um, we then completely remap your round, all automatically. You don't have to interact with the device as you play. Um, we can tell you where you played, when you played, your inward score, your outward score. These are very golf terms here. Um, but it's all completely automatic. You don't have to do anything. We can then generate 100 key performance statistics for every round you play. Um, you know, insights that are absolutely key to the golfer. And, and, and where this benefits the golfer is our users um, that use this for 30 rounds or 12 months, they actually improve their handicap by 2.7 strokes on average. We've had golfers improve their handicap by 8.5 strokes. Um, now, you put that in some sort of um, perspective, the average handicap right across the board in 30 years has not changed. You know, and it's really simple stuff. Educate the golfer using data. You know, and this is where data becomes really, really powerful. Um, and the system's designed in a way that it's highly engaging. You know, that, that, that's really the end goal here for most of the app companies. And we, we, we are a funny company. We are a hardware company, but we develop all our own apps in-house. Um, and, and I mean, what the, the people before me and the companies before me are saying about developing them in-house, man, if you can do that and you have the resources to do it, I would always advise it. You know, there's, um, you, can, you can change things, you can refine things, you can build a platform that's scalable. Um, I was a contractor, so I know all the contract pitfalls that you get into. Um, and, and, you know, contractors will try and get the job done in a certain manner to get paid, basically. You know, and you do get some good contractors out there that can really help you. But bring it in-house as quick as you can if you have the resources. Um, so yeah, the system's really engaging. So golfers on the first round will, um, will spend 35 minutes looking at the round. Remember, this is a four hour round. Um, actually for the first three rounds, they'll spend 35 minutes looking at each round. And then after that, they'll spend about 15 minutes looking at each round and have about 46 interactions with the app. So that's a lesson in itself, track everything. You know, track your marketing me metrics, track your return on investment, um, so with regards to marketing, when you put market out there, track what's coming back, um, track how they interact with your app. And, and there's a lot of technology that can sit behind and do all this. It requires work before you release the product, but it's well worth putting in good foundations at the start so you can gather real good insights as you grow your user base. Um, and it's getting to a stage for us that we have, you know, the, the MVP was our V1. Our V1 sold about 2,500 units, and it, and it was really a, a learning phase. Um, and it's interesting listening to kind of the pitfalls that companies have went through. We went through exactly that. You know, our first product um, had issues, had problems, um, and, and it was a learning process that we had to go through to then evolve and, and take it to the next stage. Um, and our V2 products are, are really a, a completely different product altogether. But we're now building a social element into the product where golfers can share um, and be awarded medals as they, as they play the game of golf. Um, and that eventually is going to go into leaderboards and, and other kind of social elements to the game. Um, but same again, all automatically. Nothing, no interaction with the, with the product as you play. Um, so some other kind of stuff around hardware, um, you know, find really good partners. You know, really, really good partners. So we are um, very fortunate that we're now working with a global manufacturer. Um, and that's, that's really useful, you know. They can provide you insights that... Um, into development and manufacturing that you just can't get from within the UK, if I'm honest. So, I mean, these guys, they build over a billion wristbands a year. A billion wristbands, right? I'm struggling to find a UK turnkey solution that builds any. And that, you know, people will sit and say, I, I would love to keep my manufacturing here in the UK, right? It's pretty cool to be able to say our manufacturers in the UK, and that's where it's been the now. And that's, that's, that's a nice thing to say, right? That's, you know, it's nice for the ecosystem here, it's nice for your suppliers here, um, but I've got 10 different suppliers that we have to manage individually. Whereas the company we're about to work with in the future, you know, it's a turnkey solution. Um, and they have the experience of building high volume of products every single year, understanding the pitfalls, understanding the pains. 
the UK, we don't do consumer goods and volume here. We do military and medical stuff amazingly well. But consumer hardware products, especially in line with what we do, it's a bit unique in the, in the UK. Um, so of course, you know, find that key supplier that does this stuff somewhere and they'll know all the pains, they'll know all the pitfalls, they'll have been there before. So, you know, try and seek these people out. They're surprising, they're willing to talk to you, you know, especially if you've got a good idea or you've got something that's interesting. They are willing to open up their doors and, and have a chat. And, you know, that's one thing I would say is, um, you know, everybody, when you're starting a business, when you're starting a, a technology company or, or, or running a startup, the amount of people that are willing to open the door and talk to you and have a coffee, have a conversation, you know, it's unreal. You just have to chat that door. You just have to drop them an email and they'll be very, very sportive. Um, we've done a lot of cool things. You know, we've got um, a number of great awards this year, both in golf and outside of golf. And that, that's important to raise the, the profile of the company. But actually, what's more important is the, the media partners that have been involved in those awards. You know, at the end of the day, you, you need these partners, these media partners, to, to get recognition for your business. We use them a lot for reviews, editorials about the company. Start to build that relationship as soon as you can. Even if you're not going to talk to them for the next two years and spend money with them for the next two years, start talking to them, start telling them what's coming, start building it up. Because, you know, they don't have enough cool stuff to write about in the market. You know, they've got the same stuff that they've been writing about year on year, and it's cool to get a startup and, and, and that's coming with something different especially a UK-based startup. You know, the companies here are all UK-based. We have also got American media partners, but these guys don't see enough startups coming from the UK. So you sit in front of them, you tell them what you're doing, you tell them about some cool tech, and they're blown away by it. And they're willing to help you, they're willing to get you to a stage where you can come and actually, you know, then go for these guys as you're spending money with them, let's be honest, you know. But that's, that's okay, they can help you a lot to get to that point. So I would use as much of that as you can. And, you know, you've got a lot of people around Edinburgh that can help you with that as well. Um, so, I mean, we, we've sold product, we sold our V2 product into 47 countries, um, sold about 12,000 units this year, which is pretty cool. Um, but, man, we've, we've got so far to go. You know, our, our vision is 100,000 units a year. So we've got miles to go here to get to that point. Um, and I think when we get to that point, we'll just have a new vi vision for quarter of a million in a year. And that's where we'll be pushing. And the market's big enough. The market's huge in golf. And it's a market that's not been getting looked after. So the opportunity's there. Um, but same again, you know, we understand that um, because of the market research we've conducted, because we've spent a lot of time at golf clubs, we've spent a lot of time talking to the governing bodies of the game um, and actually doing our research to say that the market is justifiable for us to go out and, and really go for it. Um, some of the data on it is, is pretty cool. Um, I mean, we do, we've done about 190,000 rounds this year. There's some amazing data insights that can come out of that. Um, and the reason I've got this slide up and, and some of the next slides coming up here as well is, um, you know, my goal, my, our vision and my goal at the start was to help golfers play better. Now, we can definitely do that. And it just so happens along the way that our solution, hardware, um, combination of hardware, cloud-based algorithms and apps um, has allowed golfers to improve. But as a business, we've actually found quite an exciting secondary revenue model in the data. And, you know, if you're building any technology, any product, it's amazing the data you start to collect very, very quickly. Now, we've not utilised this data yet. Um, well, actually, we have done a bit. We've we exchanged data for marketing space. So we, we had 14 pages featured on us in today's Golf Hour in August, and it was all based on the data. You know, it was all talking about the product, but it was all data-focused. So, I mean, you know, think about the... Think about the other ways your technology can be used or your product can be used or the, the, the value you're extracting from, you know, the information you're collecting or your user base. And, and you know, there's um, things that can be learned there that both help you improve your business but also give you other opportunities. Um, so, I mean, this is some of the people that we've provided insights for. Uh, media, marketing, talking to a few tours where the product would be used both to generate data and to understand performance. Um, also the media guys as well. I'm skipping through some of this because um, it's probably not as relevant for, you know, unless you're working at a data company. Um, so this is another one that, when we were building the platform, um, it was kind of an interesting story that I'll talk about. Um, we, had a, we had a choice. Uh, we could acquire data. So um, I would say there's good and bad learnings from this, but it's worthwhile having a quick discussion about. 
Um, you know, as, as a startup, you want to go quick and you want to you know, get your minimal viable product out there. Um, and you can build up certain partnerships, relations to do that. Um, now, we could have licensed in the course mapping data at a very early stage. And when we did the analysis on it and went to meet the one company in the world that provides this course mapping data accurately, we found out that annual licensing fees for 25,000 users was going to be $450,000 every year. Yeah, <laughs> a big, big number. Um, but it was okay. They were going to do a deal at $250,000, so it was all good. <laughs> but, you know, at that stage, you know, you look at that and we needed that data. We needed that data for the wristband. We needed that data for processing. We needed that data for displaying stats. So, I mean, it's absolutely logical to say we're going to map 35,000 courses ourselves. And, you know, when I said it and, and the two guys in the room that we had worked this out with said it, the rest of the team shook their heads as if to say, these guys have went mad. And we had very clever team, people around, around, we've got very clever people around the business. Um, and, and, you know, they're away searching for free data somewhere. And they keep on bringing it back and you go like, man, the quality of this data is terrible. You know, we're going to have to build it out ourselves. Um, and three and a half years later, we have built 35,000 courses. It was nine months of hell building the tech to do that. And remember, we're trying to get a product into the market. We're now building something that's never going to really be at the time we thought was going to be sellable. Um, it was just something that we needed to make our platform work. Um, and, you know, it's hard to see the, the kind of light at the end of the tunnel there. But you get two, three years along, you're scaling that. And, and all of a sudden you go, wow, massive value here. You know, so we, we've mapped courses yard by yard for every feature, and all of a sudden we've got as detailed a course database as the company we were going to license from. And we can now be a competitor to, to them if we chose to do that. Now, that's not our primary focus now. You know, you've got to keep that focus. But it's amazing if you go a different route, what you can do and add value to your product at the end. Um, hellish, though. Brutal. I mean, um, the management of this alone is a business in itself. And, and to keep this quality level up there, we, you know, we have three people in-house managing the quality. Um, at one point, we had 200 external contractors mapping these courses, mapping them at, I think, at the highest, 4,500 a month. Um, cost us £10 a course to map, to map. And of course, you're so keen to ramp it up, and then all of a sudden you go, whoa, look at the cash flow this month. 50,000 for mapping courses. If we've, if we've not sold anything yet, if we went mad. Um, but this has got real value now, and that, that's, you know, that's always look to add value. And it might not be the, you know, the, you might look at it and go, that's a dangerous way to go, but if you can constantly add value into their business, you know, when an investor's looking at you, man, they'll, they'll appreciate that. They'll really be interested in a company that constantly adds value. Um, one of the things that, that I've learned above everything else is build amazing teams, you know? Um, and that's from board level all the way down, you know? Um, we're very, very fortunate um, really, um, my CTO, Lewis Allison, and my chief commercial officer, Gavin Deer, uh, they came in really on day one. I'd been working at the technology for a year myself and moving the business forward, working on it full time. But these guys, January 2015, came in, and, and they're really co-founders. You know, they burn 60 hours a week. They're absolutely obsessed with this. They're as committed as I am to this. These two guys are really co-founders in the business, you know. Um, but we're very lucky. Everybody in the office, we've got a team of 17 in, in the office, and everybody is committed to the product. That's pretty cool. You know, that's, that's really exciting that, you know, they show that type of interest. And they're very good at their jobs as well. You know, they're very good at what they do. They're very good at adding value um, to the point that, you know, I can go out and, and go and chase investment or I can go out and uh, go and chase opportunities in the USA. No worries whatsoever. These guys are brilliant at what they do. Um, and equally, go and build a, a really amazing board. Um, very fortunate. We, we, we've raised a lot of money. You know, we've always done very well raising investment. Um, and a lot of times that comes with um, certain um, constraints around the company is probably the most pleasant way to put it. Um, and that you might get somebody forced onto your board, you know. Um, and, and whether that person adds value or not, you, you sometimes don't know. You sometimes have to go and understand that um, really through living it. Um, or what I would advise you to do is turn around and say, that guy or that girl is not suitable for us. And it doesn't matter if you say that three times until you get the right person. It's just a hard conversation to have if somebody's handed you a check, right? Really difficult. There's nothing the matter with it. You know, it'll be you or your team around you, your immediate team that makes this business happen. If you think the person that an investment group or an investor putting on at the board is not appropriate, just say it right there and then. Because it's going to be a lot more awkward conversation six months' time. 
just go for it. You know, it's take a deep breath and just go. Um, and that's the type of stuff you learn, and you only really learn it through experience. You know, um, unless you're really gutsy. I'd be impressed at that. That'd be pretty cool. Um, so we've been very lucky. We got to build our own board, and, and our board's amazing. I mean, we've got Rob Jones with Fangio here, one of the founders of Fangio. We've got Ken Lewandowski, who no one will know. But Ken, Ken was the chairman of Clydesdale Bank, and he was also the chairman of a global um, manufacturing group uh, way back in the 90s. I mean, he's exited 30 companies, um, either directly or as part of the, the, the group that's worked on the exit. Um, pretty amazing guy, nightmare to work with at times. You know, he really pushes me hard, really hard, but, um, and bizarrely, he, let, you know, he was brought up in the, the town that's a mile away from my house. It's amazing how small the world is. Um, Bill um, is our CFO, another guy that's, that's kind of not recognised as much in the Edinburgh startup community, but he's been involved with a lot of companies. Um, but Bill's IPO the company. He was the CFO that managed a £50 million IPO at £150 million valuation early 2000s. Um, pretty cool, he works in the business three days a week. And what I would say to founders, you know, it's not a bad thing to get a CFO or a, a finance person involved right from the start and try and get them in the company every day. You will learn how to look at management accounts. You will learn how to look at the P&L. You will learn how to read term sheets and go through um, legal agreements because your CFO will be amazing at it. Man, whenever he's reading those documents, you know, start to ask him questions. Start to understand it yourself. Really painful, but massive value if you can do it yourself. And then obviously a number of people will know Ian Ritchie who's, who's tech experience. So man, build a strong team, build an amazing management team, build an, a, an amazing board. And if you've got amazing people there, amazing people will come to work with you. It's absolutely critical. Um, and you know, we have, we've got 10 mad golfers, well, probably 10 mad techies and about seven mad golfers. And it's this weird mix that works amazingly well. Um, you know, when we're developing, it, the ideas come from the golfers. Um, but they have to go through their gates and their processes. So we've got about five different gates that we can throw out a project at. Um, so, you know, the first one will be an idea. The second one will be start to throw it on the whiteboard with maybe some people for the tech team, some people for the con commercial team. Justify that idea. Make sure there's a commercial reason for doing that idea. Is it going to add value to your user base? Is it going to generate revenue? Because remember, at some point you'll probably take investment or you'll probably take money from somebody or grant money or friends and family money. Man, friends and family money is the hardest money, right? You know, imagine going in and sitting with your, your parents or your friends and saying, Jesus, you know, lost your money. You know, that's brutal, because these guys are putting a lot of money in your company if you've got something good. So, you know, every shareholder, you know, think about, you know, the value they've added to your company and look after them long term. So make sure you've got a, a commercial reason for doing some of this stuff. You know, you've got to have that. Um, and if it gets through those gates, we then go into the development phase. And, and sometimes, you know, you look at a project and you're like, man, we've not got the resources, we've not got the time, we've not got the manpower, um, or, or maybe we've been out to the market and talked to the market and the market said, we don't want that now. Man, doesn't it matter how good, how sexy you think that idea is? Sometimes you've got to pack it, right? Sometimes you've got to say, that's going to have to come back later. Let's go into the next one in the queue and, and, and do the same process with that um, and, and see if it's, it's the right thing to do. But remember, it's the team that does all that. It's the team that talks to your market. It's the team that provides customer support. It's the team that comes up with these ideas and implements them. Um, as you grow, and as the team grows round about you, um, something that becomes really hard is, is you're the management guy, you know? Um, I used to be the ideas guy. I used to be the tech guy at one point. Um, I'm, now the, I'm now the management guy. I'm now the guy that looks at spreadsheets, goes out to talk to investors. That's a different game. You know, that's, that's a process that you learn and understand, and, and you really have to get comfortable with it. And, and if I'm honest, if you're not comfortable at it, try and get a, a, a co-founder that might be, you know, do the bit that you're really good at, do the bit you're passionate about, and you'll do it much, much better than anything else. Um, but these, this will be the team, you know, this is your team here that will develop your product for you. Man, look after them. They're, they're the guys that are making, and the girls that are making this happen. Um, so top takeaways, and I'm, I'm realizing I'm ranting on a bit here, uh, uh, last up as well. Um, Build foundations, man. Build really good foundations, whether it's tech, whether it's team, whether it's the investment um, partnerships that, that you bring into the company. Build really good foundations that you trust and, and help you grow the company. Um, you know, try and make sure that that founding team has got the shared vision. Um, you know, if you've got a founder who wants to exit really quickly, but the rest of your team don't, man, that makes developing the, the business really hard. Try and make sure it's a shared vision um, that you're working on. Uh, I can't understate how much market research drives everything. You know, if the market doesn't want it, fail fast. Go out, talk to the market, 
find out, and if the market doesn't want it, fail fast, move on to the next thing. You know, you'll find something the market wants, but go out there and talk to the market. Don't be scared about it, just go and do it. Um, good design and good products just take long, a long, long time. You know, a long, long time to do. Um, get the MVP out as quick as you can, make sure it's good, make sure it's scalable, which has been spoken about a lot here. Um, make sure it is something you can build on and your user base, it isn't going to damage your user base because it's, it's not adequate and it's not to a level it has to be before it gets launched. Um, and then as an engineer, I, I just love processes and it doesn't really matter if it's technical, marketing, um, you know, digital marketing is the best one. Man, process digital marketing, just like you wouldn't believe. It's a great one just to process, process, process. Read up on processes for digital marketing. Um, so it doesn't really matter if it's marketing. It doesn't really matter if it's tech development. It doesn't really matter if it's management team and running the management team and getting together. Process it. You know, the more you can process, the more you can step over here and go and chase something over here when everybody else here is, is, is running it. You know, and that's, what, that's where we're really, really fortunate our team believes in processes or I've went on about it long enough that they've had no other choice um, and then constantly add value look for things in the business things you do that constantly add value because you're here to build value you know you're here to build value for your shareholders for your team for yourself as the founder go and build value into the company wherever you can um, and I guess, you know, it's a, it's a lot of fun um, getting involved in startups and, and anybody that's thinking about it should definitely go and do it, you know. Um, go and make up a hacky, minimal vile product or something you could take to the market and go and talk to them and just, just see where it goes. Thank you very much. Thank you.